Hello everyone and welcome to The Art of AI Poisoning. Without further ado, let me introduce who I am and why you should listen to me. <laughs> so, my name is David willis Owen. I work as an email security engineer in my day job, but I have over three years of experience working in cybersecurity at the largest US bank in the world. Among my achievements, I run the AI Blade blog and podcast. I run this YouTube channel. I also presented at B Sides London 2024 some novel research called the indirect prompt injection methodology. Since then, I've pivoted to looking at AI training data poisoning, as I believe it's a far more pressing issue which is not being looked at enough. So, by the end of this session, you will know what AI data training poisoning actually is, so we'll all be on the same page. We'll look at why AI poisoning is both feasible and impactful. And finally, how can we expose AI data poisoning attacks in the wild? To begin with, let's ensure we're all on the same page with a definition. So, I've taken this from OWASP, which stands for the Open Web Application Security Project, and this is one of the most trustworthy resources in the whole of cybersecurity. So this is their MLO2 risk. MLO2 is basically the second most impactful risk in a set of 10 for their OWASP top 10 machine learning risks. And their definition goes as follows. Training data poisoning is when an attacker manipulates the training data to cause the model to behave in an undesirable way. Simply put, if you train the model on bad data, it will produce bad outputs. So this brings us to the billion dollar questions. I haven't put million dollar question because answers to these questions could save companies billions of dollars from getting completely owned by threat actors. Number one, is it possible to poison production grade AI models or are their training data sets simply too big? Number two, if this is possible, is it worthwhile for threat actors? And number three, if poisoning is worthwhile and it's possible, why haven't we found this in the wild yet? I've taken a look at a bunch of academic white papers, I've done my own research, and I'm going to present them in this distilled version throughout this presentation. So before we jump into the white papers, we need to consider how AI models are actually trained, specifically large AI models. So large language models are trained on cleaned up versions of the web using data sets such as Common Cruel. And Common Cruel is, to quote them, a free open repository of web cruel data. Companies like OpenAI will take these data sets and convert them into tokens, or basically split up human readable text. If you can poison the web, in other words, you can poison AI because you can inject into data sets such as Common Cruel. So now we're all on the same page, let's look at case study number one. Case study one is a tool called Nightshade, and this is a free defensive tool that artists can use to protect their online art against being used as training data. What Nightshade does is it applies a subtle filter of pixels on top of images. This is completely invisible to the human eye. However, to an AI model, they will pick up on these pixels and generate unpredictable outputs if they are trained on too many of these samples. So I included this one because it's a really good example of how poisoning is actually being used as a defensive tool and adds more context to the matter. This forces companies to take care training on data without consent, because if they do so recklessly, their model will be unusable. Case study two is something called Trojan Puzzle, and we have some really interesting diagrams looking at this in a second. And Trojan Puzzle, is an attack against code suggestion models. The way it works is the researchers of this white paper were able to inject insecure patterns into the fine tuning data sets of Codex, which, sorry, it was actually a Salesforce coding model. 
So they injected into a Salesforce coding model fine tuning data sets, but they swapped a keyword out to bypass scanners. So typically, a static code analysis tool would basically check for known insecure patterns, but if they swap out the word render for home, for example, then it will completely bypass one of these scanners. So the model learns this pattern with a non-vulnerable word, and then it suggests vulnerable code when it sees the trigger word. This, I'll show you an example in a second, but the headline figure is, this attack has a hit rate of 20%, with only 0.1% of the fine tuning data set poisoned. And that's a really crucial statistic, which we'll look at later. But here on the screen, I have an example of this working. On the left, these are the poison samples. So we're trying to create a vulnerability in the render template function. In the poison samples, we have one saying home template, family template, all templates. And as such, in these poison samples, the model learns the pattern with this snippet of code and then basically injecting the word all or the word family or the word home into the later on code. Then when it comes to actually suggesting based on an input, the render templates input, then the poison model will suggest this insecure design pattern using the keyword render. So a very, very ingenious method to poison AI models. But yeah, as I said, the scary thing is you only need access to 0.1% of the fine tuning data set to get a hit rate on this attack of 20%. And we'll consider that later as well. Case study number three is something I call AI suicide. Now, the actual white paper was called the curse of recursion, but AI models are statistical approximations of their training data, so they contain minute errors. Basically, if you recursively train an AI model on AI-generated data, the errors will exponentially compound, making it objectively worse with each iteration. So the errors will keep multiplying against themselves in layman's terms. And this will mean if you get to iteration nine, for example, the model will be completely unintelligible in its output. Let's look at the case study we have here. So, what the researchers did is they put an, an initial input talking about 1360, about a parish, on the very first output. So this is model zero. This hasn't been trained on AI data. This is a base model. It completely completes the sentence normally. It talks about St. John's Cathedral in London. And we start training the model on AI generated data over and over and over and over again, until we get to the point where by generation nine, we have this complete nonsense where it's copied over the at tokens, talks about blue tailed jackrabbits, red tailed jackrabbits, completely unintelligible output. So this is playing out in real time for production models, albeit on a much slower time scale. This begs the question, in 20 years when most of the web is AI generated content, I think we can all agree that's the way the web is going with it being far faster, then will these models start poisoning themselves? If you've been enjoying this video so far, I'd like to quickly draw your attention to Notion. Notion is a completely free note-taking app and website, and I use this on a day-to-day -day basis when preparing scripts, writing codes, and many other use cases. Notion offers paid features such as AI integration and team space collaboration. But if you'd like to get started, feel free to check out the link in my description and sign up completely free of charge and start using it. Thank you very much, and we'll go back to the video now. So that's a really interesting case study, but I'd like to bring us back to the initial questions. Now we have a bit more context on the kind of academia and what's possible. Number one, is it possible to poison AI models? Theoretically, yes. We have the nightshade white paper, we have the AI suicide research, and both of these 
are great theoretical demonstrations of poisoning in action. In practice, we can do this, but it is admittedly difficult. Let's revisit Trojan Puzzle, where we had that headline figure, 0.1% of samples needed to be poisoned for a 20% hit rate. Now I put a note here, this is a surprisingly low proportion. This is because models are able to quickly recognize patterns. Most of the data that models ingest is unstructured. So if they see a repeating theme over and over again in just a small sample, they will reinforce this pattern and it will have a high weight in their model weights to go down effectively. So we don't need to poison too much of the data to realize a significant impact. For an example, if we use a million code files for a fine tuning data set, we don't have the actual figure as to how many were used in Copilot for the fine tuning. I believe 54 million code files were used in the initial training data set. So 1 million could be somewhat of a good approximation. It will be on the same order of magnitude. If we have this fine tuning data set, we only need to poison 1000 files. That begs the question, is it worth doing? So many corporations are using code suggestion tools to write applications. Even Google themselves have admitted to leveraging AI generated code. A threat actor could insert backdoors and vulnerabilities into production applications by simply poisoning a proportion of files on GitHub, smaller than 1%, maybe as low as 0.1% or maybe even smaller. These code repos would need to be highly rated and trusted. So it would be very difficult to do. High effort, but very high reward. Imagine if you could inject the same vulnerability into several apps at once, it would really be an attacker's dream. So it's feasible for nation states, given other attacks we've seen, such as SolarWinds, where um, there was basically a supply chain attack on a really critical part of IT infrastructure that many companies and applications use. I'm paraphrasing there, but it's definitely doable for a nation state actor. So I'm going to say it is worth it. Question three, where are they? If poisoning is feasible and worthwhile, we should have already detected poison models in the wild. One study actually said that 40% of the code generated by GitHub Copilot contains a vulnerability. This was in 2021, so the hit rate is probably far lower now. However, it's difficult to detect poisoning versus hallucination. Code can be generic and hard to attribute to a repo or an individual. So how can we expose AI poisoning? And this is really the research I've been doing in my spare time. Step one, we can gather a large data set of developer prompts, prompts which people would use, people would ask models for in coding terms. Part two, we can query an up-to-date model and obtain as many AI responses as possible to give us a large data set of AI generated code. We could then parse all that code into a static code analyzer and highlight vulnerable patterns throughout this. We could then take said vulnerable patterns and cross reference any indicators of compromise found in the outputs, such as domains, comments, IP addresses with GitHub, because GitHub is a huge public repository of all these code bases. And then step five, we can perform standard threat intelligence techniques on the offending repositories. We can use whois lookups, we can cross reference them with other reputable threat intelligence sources to try and gain more info on who these people are and why they're doing the things they do. So this brings me on to experiment one, which I have briefly documented on this channel. GitHub offers a command line interface tool to quickly get code suggestions. So the example usage of this would be GH copilot suggest list all files in directory hyphen T shell. And what I did is I created a bash script to infinitely pull code samples. I focused on GitHub copilot first because my mind immediately went to it in terms of a production grade coding model. 
However, although I did manage to obtain codes, GH Copilot has a very limited context window. I could only extract around 100 tokens per output. Don't quote me on that, that is a complete finger in the air figure. And several of my requests were actually blocked in doing this. Furthermore, it was incapable of writing complex functionality. So the example on the screen here, it didn't get much longer than that. I was actually asking it to try performing a dig command on as many different domains as possible to try and maybe expose a malicious domain in its data set. And as we can see, it came up with these example placeholder domains. So it's not playing ball. However, experiment two, I combined DeepSeek with a data set called DevGPT. So I used Hugging Face Inference to spin up my own DeepSeek, Co DeepSeek Coder V2 Lite instance with four graphical processing units. This gives complex outputs and it has far fewer guardrails compared to something like GitHub Copilot. Next up, I did some research and found a dataset called DevGPT. This was curated in 2023, and it's a dataset containing 18,000 real prompts by developers, which were passed to ChatGPT at the time. I ran my model for two hours. I set up a Python script to continually ask prompts from the DevGPT dataset, and I was able to contain, I was able to obtain answers to the first 900 prompts. And this is 90,000 lines of code I was able to extract. So now I have this big data set to pass through. DevGPT itself also contained answers from those 2023 ChatGPT answers. So I have a larger but more dated set of answers in addition to the ones I was able to harvest from DeepSeek. I skimmed through both of these, and at first glance, there are no obviously glaring domains, IP addresses, or malicious code patterns. However, all I did was a simple find in Notepad++ for a few obvious signs, and it wouldn't be that obvious, otherwise it would already have been found. I tried to pass the entire file through semgrep, but it got confused due to the convoluted nature of the contents of these files. Semgrep is a cutting edge static code analysis tool, and it simply didn't play ball. Even when I converted my file to a Python file, the formatting was just not what it expected, and it wasn't able to find any vulnerabilities in the output. So what are the next steps? I need to pass this output into a static code analyzer line by line. And for the flag lines, I need to cross-reference any indicators I find against GitHub. If I find any suspicious repositories, I need to investigate further. So in conclusion, AI poisoning is an incredibly impactful attack, especially against code models. It's both feasible and worthwhile for threat actors, despite being difficult to pull off. And I believe popular AI models are actively being poisoned I want to find conclusive evidence and document the journey along the way. Thank you so much, everybody, for staying tuned if you've got this far through. If you enjoyed this model, please consider liking, subscribing, commenting, and sharing. And I look forward to seeing you in the next one.